Ladies and gentlemen, I think the coffee break is over, so I'm going to ask you to get back to your seats, if possible. Thank you so much. If you have friends outside, you can encourage them to, to join us. Okay, thank you. So, uh, our next panel is about the challenges and opportunities in developing transnational tourism routes, and namely the Silk Road as a case study. And uh, I would like to invite on stage the moderator of this panel, Mr. Patrick Fritz, Technical Coordinator, Technical Cooperation, and Silk Road Department in UNWTO. Mr. Patrick Fritz has, has been working for the World Tourist Organization since 2013 as the technical coordinator of the Technical Cooperation and Silk Road Department. Mr. Fritz is responsible for United Nations World Tourist Organization Silk Road activities, an area of work comparing 34 member states and numerous UNWTO affiliate members who co collaborate in the areas of marketing and promotion capacity building and destination management, and travel facilitation. A guide in political science and international relations, he studied in the University of Vienna and Trinity College, Dublin. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Patrick Fritz, stage is yours. Um, hello, everybody. Um, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, as said, my name is Patrick Fritz. I'm the technical coordinator of the Technical Cooperation and Silk Road Department. And during my time at UNWTO, I have been mainly dealing with the development of the Silk Road as a transnational tourism route. As some of you may know, UNWTO's Silk Road Initiative is a collaborative platform of 34 member states. And we develop sustainable and internationally competitive tourism by working within four key areas, which are marketing and promotion, capacity building and destination management, travel facilitation, and Silk Road um, research and tourism trainings. And um, while during today's session we'll draw on the Silk Road, the focus will be a general mix of theory and practice as we assess the challenges and opportunities of developing um, transnational tourism routes. We have panelists working within different spheres of the tourism sector, whereby a central question will be how to move from awareness raising to product development and transnational route management. From an academic perspective, this may mean to ask, for example, what tangible output can research have? Can research work transnationally? What needs to be in place before moving over to product packaging and product promotion? If we look at the private sector, we may ask, what does the private sector find interesting in transnational routes? Is it something they are willing to invest in? If so, why? However, before we move over to these questions, please allow me to briefly frame or introduce the topic of our session, because I believe it's important because while um, transnational cooperation may seem um, frustrating, slow, and even ineffective at times. Transnational route development also entails great opportunities worth exploring. And as a representative of a, an international organization, I just wanted to, to touch upon a few um, points in the following. I'll start by highlighting the opportunities of transnational tourism, which I believe can be summarized as follows. The emergence of transnational tourism routes, which entails cooperation across borders among many different stakeholders with different goals and objectives, is a direct result of the changes brought forward by globalization. So what does this mean exactly? Well, basically that globalization has changed the tourism sector in such a way that cooperation across borders, even if a product is locally embedded, has not only become the new normal, but will also determine the future of the tourism sector. And a few key points will actually underline um, this statement here. Well, of course, the first reason uh, is the resilience and continuous growth of the tourism industry. As, is, as has already been mentioned yesterday and today, um, international tourist arrivals grew by 6% in the first um, six months of 2018, thus not only continuing the record-breaking 2017 year, which saw a 7% yearly increase in comparison to 2016, but even exceeded UNWO's initial forecasts for the year. 
World tourism growth is balanced and a global phenomenon. Um, we see, for example, Europe and Asia, um, Asia and the Pacific with a 7% rise, uh, maintain their leading role, but figures of stable growth are also observable in the Americas, the Middle East, and Africa. So now in contrast to 15 or even 20 years ago, um, travel has become a global normality that can no longer be reversed. So when we talk about um, tourism, um, the key figure or indicative is um, tourism management. You have to manage a tourism route well, be it local, national, or global, because otherwise um, you'll pretty quickly hit um, um, barriers that will not allow you to move forward anymore. Um, the second reason references um, shifts happening on a global scale, a uh, development process co coined by Moises Naim as the more mobility and mentality revolutions. Now, this point may entails a lot of different aspects, but I'll briefly summarize um, the key elements. The more revolution means that the world output from population growth to market products has increased rapidly over the last decades, whereby quantitative growth in total numbers goes hand in hand with qualitative improvements. For example, the world's economic output has increased fivefold and income per capita is three and a half times greater than it was in 1950. I could mention a lot of other global indicators such as global life expectancy, literacy rates, serial production, and similar wealth indicators, but the main point is that the progress we are experiencing is unique in terms of numbers and duration. And why is this important? Well, because when people are better nourished, healthier, more educated, better informed, and more connected to others, priorities start to evolve, especially if these changes are paired with improvements in other areas, which leads me to the mobility and mentality revolutions. Because um, whereas the more revolution entails the opening up of opportunities, the mobility revolution entails their potential realization. Connectivity, understood in terms of widespread communication and transportation indicators, is a key feature to the global middle class, which in total numbers is growing year by year. For example, according to the International Air Transport Association, IATA, routes to, from, and within Asia and the Pacific will see an extra 1.8 billion passengers by 2035 for an overall market size of 3.1 billion. That is an average expected annual growth rate of nearly 5%. So what are the consequences of such developments? Well, whereas the more revolution entails the opening up of opportunities and the mobility revolution, their potential realization, the mentality revolution implies a fundamental change in how we see and interact on a local, national, and global scale. Globalization, urbanization, changes in the family structure, the rise of new industries and opportunities, the global spread of English, these have had consequences in every sphere, but their effect has been most fundamental at the level of attitudes. That is, the ever-increasing salience of aspiration as a motivator of our actions and behaviors. So as you know, representatives of the tourism sector sufficiently know, and as we were able to hear um, today during the first two presentations, experiential travel, the search for new experiences and destinations is a global phenomenon on the rise from which especially destinations with natural and cultural heritage will benefit from in the years to come. Which leads me to the third main reason, which is, um, and something that directly references the Silk Road, which is the emergence of new development plans that clearly recognize the importance of cooperation and partnerships across borders. Because as the 2008 financial crisis brought to light, it became a necessity to distribute global growth and development. New development plans and multilateral institutions started to emerge, all taking place across the Silk Road region. Um, just to name a few, we have the New Development Bank, established by the BRICS countries, Korea's Eurasian Initiative, Russia's vision for a Eurasian Economic Union, and of course, China's Belt and Road Initiative. Supported by new modes of collaboration and financial institutions, such as the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank and the Silk Road Fund, destinations are already benefiting from projects happening in the areas of infrastructure, energy, and transportation. So generally speaking, um, framework conditions have never been so favorable for the development of daring tourism projects that aim to actually unite countries together to develop projects that cross three, five, ten, or in the case of the Silk Road, 34 countries. But unfortunately, not all that glitters is gold, and transnational cooperation does entail risks and challenges that are not easily overcome. Well, we'll, we'll discuss some of these challenges throughout the session, but um, please allow me to mention a few that I believe important um, from the perspective of an international organization. Well, to begin with, it is worth mentioning that while no two routes are the same, neither in outreach, vision, nor initiatives developed, they all share similar difficulties. 
When cooperating transnationally, one has to deal with various stakeholders from various fields and policy levels that represent interests, both long-term and short-term, that may not always coincide. Additionally, one is confronted with a plurality, plurality of laws, regulations and procedures that normally reflect a set of ideas or a cultural understanding that may but, may but may not be similar between countries. Now, if we picture this happening in a time when history fueled by technology is in constant acceleration, meaning that stakeholders, instead of building consensus and delivering jointly, are under a strong pressure to innovate and differentiate their products from the rest, then we achieve a pretty accurate pr um, picture of the complexity of our enterprise. Moreover, the task is even first, uh, further worsened if one bears in mind the not always easy relationship between the spheres of culture and tourism. What was once falsely perceived as, as two sectors pursuing opposite goals is now correctly viewed as an interdependent partnership. Sustainable goals and criteria are now an indispensable part of all tourism projects, whereas culture, aware that heritage has to be enlivened in order to remain important, recognizes that the role played by the tourism sector in raising awareness, generating funds, and maintaining the outstanding universal value of sites across the globe. However, I mean, interests may clash and have to be balanced, something that was an important point that was mentioned yesterday, especially when you work on projects um, based on ancient heritage that are a source of meaning, pride, and income for host communities. Another reason is um, a major concern, at least, is to assess the links or common theme that is to give meaning and consistency to any intended transnational route. I can express that differently by saying a marketing and communications plan or brand should always be the last step of a long process. Promotion should always be the icing on the cake and, and not the main dish. And sometimes if you look at um, projects happening or interests by countries, it's always, oh, let's, let's have a logo and then we'll see what we do with the rest of the route. That's, it should be the other way around. First, you should you know, work on the basics and then a promotional um, campaign, a logo, a brand is always the last step and never the, never the first one. But um, it's quite funny how we see it normally um, being overturned in that sense. Um, but this being said, the development of a common theme will not go very far. It cannot justify investments and business profits. The engagement of the private sector um, is essential if a route is to have a future. It is, it is not always easy to keep these people engaged. The long-term commitment of the private sector is one of the most difficult challenges any route faces. And unfortunately, what may work for one route may not work for another route um, due to specific conditions on the ground. So it's always a, a challenge um, to keep um, this, um, the private sector involved. And finally, um, another major challenge from the perspective of an international organization is to keep all rallied stakeholders engaged throughout a long period of time. Governments and priorities change, meaning that long-term financing is a necessity, especially if a route is to be developed from scratch. Um, well, basically, ladies and gentlemen, with this um, brief presentation, what I wanted to do was provide you with some background thoughts, while in the following, we will, we will actually have a look at more specific um, challenges and opportunities of developing transnational tourism. Because while Stella, from the Aristotle University will be focusing mainly on research and the initial stages of route development. Barnaby um, will be looking at the business side of the work and we also have a representative from Bulgaria who will give us his national perspective on what we are on, on the topic at hand. Um, you know, that is what is needed in order to move on from awareness raising to transnational product management. So without further ado, I'd like to thank you all for being here today and please let us welcome our first speaker, Stella, who is Associate Professor of Regional and, and Tourism Development at the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki and Head of the European Interdis Interdisciplinary Silk Road Tourism Centre, also located at um, Aristotle University. So Stella, please welcome to the stage. Thank you, Patrick. Hello, ladies and uh, gentlemen, uh, distinguished uh, uh, guest. I am uh, uh, really glad and honored to participate to the uh, second uh, International uh, World Congress on uh, World uh, uh, Civilizations and uh, Historic uh, uh, Roots. Many thanks to the organizers for an excellent uh, event and uh, for a very warm uh, hospitality. Uh, well, I have to warn you that uh, 
I have no videos. I have no photo gallery. And uh, I'm, unfortunately, I'm not a Silk Road runner like Marcus. I really envy you. Well, the best I could do is to walk the Silk Road. So, who knows? Maybe in the fourth or fifth World Congress, lost weight, and be here to show you impressive videos and uh, photo galleries. <laughs> I, don't, I can't give a promise. I have to be probably prepared to give the promise, okay? <laughs> but thank you anyway, thank you very much. Uh, so my presentation will deal with uh, Silk Road history, uh, routes, the challenges and uh, prospects for tourism. As an academic, I will go through the basics about uh, tourism and uh, the Silk Road. Uh, and then I will um, present the uh, involvement of uh, Aristotle University of uh, Thessaloniki in the Silk Road, the Western Silk Road uh, uh, United Nations World Tourism Organization uh, program. Uh, let's start with um, the basic uh, question. Uh, as we all very well know, there are far too many answers why tourism and travel uh, because uh, it is a growing global industry since the late 50s, is still growing and is expected to grow in increasing rates for the decades to come because it's very important in strict economic terms, in uh, GDP participation, in uh, the number of, um, of jobs uh, uh, offered in uh, exports. But it's uh, uh, also very important in social terms, in uh, cultural terms, in environmental and even in political terms. However, there is um, uh, a question that raises far too many questions, is how tourism and travel? Uh, how can we uh, make uh, the potential tourist be excited enough to buy the ticket? to travel, to visit the destination, to stay at the destination, to explore the places, to explore the cultures, and respect the places and the cultures. To stay longer and to share his experience or her experience on the way back and hopefully be back again. On the other extreme, how to avoid over-tourism? Uh, there, are, there is a, a, an academic and policy debate nowadays about the negative impact of um, over-tourism development in cities and in uh, cultural heritage uh, sites. So, in brief, the main question that arises is how to transform places into the so-called 3S destinations. And by 3S, I mean sustainable, smart, sophisticated. And uh, by sustainable uh, means that the destination has to respect the sustainability goals. By smart means that to uh, make the best out of the latest technologies and digitization. And by sophisticated means to uh, produce uh, uh, pro a tourism product based on authenticity and high quality. So uh, a useful tool in order to have this kind of uh, sustainable, smart, and sophisticated destination is storytelling. We have uh, seen during the previous sessions quite uh, successful examples about storytelling. So it is uh, clear enough that storytelling can inspire and can motivate the travelers. But let's think about history telling that can go further and fascinate the traveler, and even better, educate the traveler. So uh, the cultural roots seems to be a very good practice of uh, this kind of uh, destinations. That means uh, uh, a tourism product that has a, as a goal uh, to learn and experience the visitor for the places visited. We had these excellent presentations uh, yesterday about La Rota dei Fenici and uh, the Via Rodopica and the Santiago de Compostela and on the other side of the Atlantic, the Route 66. However, it seems that there is uh, a route that is considered to be 
the most important in the history of mankind, and this is the Silk Road that we are talking about. Three emblematic figures, Alexander the Great, uh, Xiang Quang, apologies, I cannot pronounce it properly, and Marco Polo. Alexander the Great, the conqueror, uh, who went um, till the far distant lands of, of Persia, seems that he was the first Western uh, legendary figure that um, he had, um, he, he thought quite ahead of his times and he realized the benefits of the osmosis between the Western and Eastern civilizations. And then we have the diplomacy of China that went uh, far uh, to reach uh, the uh, Alexander the Great uh, places that he visited. And finally, the most famous storyteller, Marco Polo, that with his book in uh, 1300, he made this trip to China popular to everyone and a fascinating book till now. So the Silk Road at those times was um, actually an immense network of routes. It was for the German geographer that he named in um, uh, the uh, eighth century Silk Road. It was uh, a complex network of routes uh, connecting uh, different places, mainly through commerce. But uh, commerce is realized by people and people have ideas, they have art, they have religions. Um, so this was also an exchange of ideas, of art, and also of technology of those times and of uh, uh, religions. Uh, nowadays, uh, the Silk Road, based on huge infrastructure plans that uh, are realized all over uh, Asia, uh, deals with economies that are growing in faster rates and um, new destinations that uh, emerge nearly every year. And um, improved connectivity via transnational rail links. And of course, all this is supported by the internet accessibility and by the uh, social media. Of course, the, sorry, uh, the World Tourism Organization was uh, the first to put on the table the discussion about the Silk Road uh, tourism development in, back in 1994 in, uh, with the Samarkand uh, uh, Declaration. And uh, it went on for many decades working on the Silk Road uh, program uh, with many, many activities and uh, successes. Uh, it was in 2013, actually, that the Silk Road uh, came in the economic and political agenda all over Asia and uh, Europe. And this was done with the uh, One Belt, One Road, the Obor Chinese strategy that was then renamed as initiative about the new Silk Road economic belt on land and the 21st century maritime Silk Road. Uh, maybe this map is already changed to include the Polar Silk Road. But however, uh, this is a general view <coughs> sorry, of the um, uh, plan of, of China to create uh, a sinocentric uh, uh, area of commerce all over the uh, Eurasia uh, continent. So in 2026, the, the World Tourism Organization together with the European uh, Commission announced they launched uh, a new program uh, to extend actually the ASEAN Silk Road, the classic Silk Road tourism product program. And this was the Western Silk Road tourism. This was the question actually, uh, what is the involvement of Western uh, economies and societies to tourism? Which are the links? And um, which, which is the footprint of Silk Road in um, uh, Western countries. There are a lot of uh, activities ab about uh, the Western Silk Road uh, program that uh, come to join all the activities that are, have been going on in, uh, in Asia since 1994. For example, in Asia you have already far too many cultural routes going on based on the Silk Road uh, legacy. Uh, the Persian Silk Road, or the Kyrgyz Silk Road, or the Central Asian uh, Oasis. 
Uh, last year, in the exhibition in, um, in London, uh, there have been uh, quite a number of new tourism packages. So the industry is already in. Tourism packages that start from Shanghai and end to Istanbul, but uh, they go even further. They start from Shanghai and they end to Hamburg. So it seems that uh, we are uh, about to face a rising Silk Road tourist market that um, seems to have unlimited uh, routes to propose. For example, uh, a route to propose is following the traces of Alexander the Great from here to Afghanistan or even uh, further. Uh, the, the rising uh, Chinese market, uh, the so-called the free independent travelers that do not like tourism packages and they want to experience, experience tourism. Uh, sorry. Uh, will uh, uh, figure out this um, uh, new rise in market. Just to keep in mind that uh, this uh, part of the, uh, of the market is about 40 percent. I mean, the uh, China's free independent travelers are 40 percent of the Chinese market. And the Chinese market is 49 percent of the Asian market, which will be uh, the global racer. So only recently, uh, in late October 2018, uh, an announcement from Bloomberg uh, ident uh, noticed that um, uh, we expect 800 billion Silk Road uh, dollars on the Silk Road industry. That means that the tourism development process in this area is really unlimited. So we are facing quite a problem here. How to organize this market, how to properly organize this market. So to uh, give the opportunity to places to develop, but at the same time to protect uh, places from uh, over tourism. How to transform uh, places into 3S destinations on the Silk Road. So the proposal is to create a QT, that means a cultural, Tourism for Education, New Silk Road Tourism Model. And this needs research. Okay. Um, it is a complex tourism sister, system because a large number of countries are involved with uh, different cultures, uh, with different economic and political systems, in many cases with barriers in um, uh, crossing the borders, on in barriers in political terms. So we have quite a, pol a complex system and we need to systematically organize this uh, large new tourism uh, market. World well, Tourism Organization has already put this question on the table because in the uh, Western Silk Road Initiative, they proposed two pillars, two strategic pillars. The one is research and the, the other is capacity building. And by research, uh, it is meant uh, to create a joint tourism intelligence and common methodologies so as to be able to have comparable data. And this is quite important if we are to analyze and properly plan the synergies within this very complex system. So uh, Aristotle University has been um, involved with uh, the Western Silk Road program from the very beginning. Let me briefly introduce my university, established in 1925, is the largest in Greece and the largest in Southeastern, Uni Southeastern uh, uh, Europe. Uh, the largest in terms of uh, number of students, 75,000 students. And um, in, uh, in terms of the disciplines, since this is a multi-thematic uh, university, nearly all disciplines are covered. Uh, it is uh, a university quite active in uh, European educational programs, in international education programs, and uh, in uh, participation in university networks. Uh, only recently, in August 2017, the European Interdisciplinary Silk Road Tourism Center has been established 
uh, under the auspices of um, the, the Ministry of Tourism uh, of Greece and uh, with the support of the World Tourism Organization. This um, uh, tourism center has as main uh, aims to provide systematic study and uh, uh, databases interpretation, to publish uh, studies and research findings, and to promote networking of universities, universities from uh, uh, Europe, with universities from Asia, but also in the broader Mediterranean uh, area. The first uh, uh, study that uh, we produced was uh, um, a call from the World Tourism Organization to study the footprint of the Silk Road in Greece as part of the Western Silk Road uh, project um, uh, initiative. So uh, a group of senior and um, uh, younger researchers uh, have been um, uh, working quite hard for 40 days exactly. One of them is present here, Mr. Dimitris Kiryaku, Kiryaku uh, PhD candidate. So uh, we had a quite large uh, survey uh, all over Greece with something like 600 uh, questionnaires to all uh, tourism stakeholders involved. The main uh, uh, outcome was that uh, nearly everyone, I mean the vast majority, were not aware of the Silk Road and uh, of course they didn't include any Silk Road activities in their uh, tourism development plans. Um, we went to um, first uh, approach to identify the Silk Road um, uh, cultural footprint uh, at the regional uh, basis, uh, try to locate uh, sites that have that had a reference with uh, the Silk Road. Uh, we went through a short analysis at the regional basis and also at the national basis. And um, finally, we end up with uh, um, a map, which is at the initial stage uh, of the Silk Road in, in Greece, indicated the, the places that have a reference to the Silk Road legacy. Uh, now this map is um, under reconstruction to be a proper GIS map. Now, the ongoing research that um, we are working on uh, in uh, Aristotle University and the European Interdisciplinary Silk Road Center is to uh, formulate the problem on um, network basis analysis. That means have the destinations at an hierarchical level uh, where the uh, big node is the uh, transport hub, for example, and we have the links between these nodes, that is the historic links and the tourism links existing or uh, potential. So if we formulate the, the problem at uh, a network analysis basis, then we can use the concept of polycentricity that indicates the connection of neighbor centers that is a reference to cultural roots, of course. Centers that have common characteristics and um, uh, their integration in wider spatial terms. So by use of graph theory, we can have uh, um, these uh, networks fragmented, for example, in terms of hierarchy or in terms of connectivity, and so to end up with uh, smaller uh, networks at the regional level, at the national level, at the cross-border level, or at the international level. Um, we can have um, the morphological dimension that is the characteristics of each node in terms of size, rank, location, or cultural heritage. Uh, we can have the functional dimension in terms of the links, of the characteristics of the links between the nodes. Let's make it simple. For example, in each destination, we have uh, a common characteristic, more or less common, that is the spices, uh, markets, the bazaars. So this is uh, a cultural heritage food, footprint quite directly relevant to the Silk Road. So this is a morphological characteristic of each note. And then we have the caravanserais, uh, valuable architectural uh, footprints. Uh, that uh, indicate the crossroads of commerce and, and culture. So they are everywhere. 
and this can, uh, in a way, characterize the links. So we need some methodological tools now. And these tools uh, may be ontologies that uh, give the possibility to share knowledge, um, to organize information, uh, so as to have a system of classification and taxonomy. Uh, this is an ongoing research and uh, please, all uh, colleagues that are interested uh, in are uh, uh, kindly invited to, to join us. Now, uh, Aristotle University and the Center has been actively uh, participating in um, the capacity building activities of uh, uh, the Western Silk Road uh, Initiative uh, by uh, organizing workshops in uh, Thessaloniki and also participating in um, uh, activities within the year Greece, the cultural year Greece China in 2017. Uh, we also participated in both international Western Sea Road workshops in Alexandrupolis and in um, uh, Sofia in uh, last year. Finally, uh, we submitted the application to the World Tourism Organization together with the region of Central Macedonia and uh, the Thessaloniki Convention Bureau uh, to host the eighth international meeting of the World Tourism Organization. Actually, uh, in our area, this was a best practice of synergies between the industry, the tourism industry, the local authorities and academia. And um, we succeeded in um, uh, being in my, uh, our application being uh, accepted. So uh, we had the honor to host the eighth international meeting in um, October 2018. Uh, it was um, uh, a prestigious uh, uh, event. We are very proud that we hosted this event in our uh, city and uh, region and, uh, and country. Uh, during this um, event, uh, a memorandum of <coughs> understanding uh, has been signed between the World Teams Organization and Aristotle University of Thessaloniki, signed by the General Secretary of uh, uh, United Nations World Teams Organization, Mr. Zurab Palakalsvili, and uh, the Rector of Aristotle University, Professor uh, Pericles uh, Mitkas. Uh, this memorandum is uh, uh, actually uh, to support the research, dissemination, and training activities of the European Interdisciplinary Silk Road Tourism uh, Center. Now, our next step is the realization of um, uh, a Black Sea uh, Basin Interreg uh, program that has been uh, uh, already signed. It is called Silk, Silk Road Local Culture. And uh, it aims at identifying, documenting, and mapping uh, the cultural footprint of Silk Road and assessing its growth poten potential in Black Sea countries. To create a Silk Road virtual observatory, to create an, um, a network, an entrepreneurial network based on the Silk Road footprint, uh, to create also a label to certify uh, quality affiliates uh, that means entrepreneurs to the network, and of course many other uh, activities like a portable museum, promotion video, storytelling, and so on. The uh, partnership includes, apart from Aristotle University, who is the lead partner, uh, University of Varna in Bulgaria, uh, National Association for Rural Ecological and Cultural Tourism in Romania, uh, Russian Armenian University in Armenia, and the uh, International Center for, Special, for Social Research and uh, Policy Analysis in um, uh, Georgia. So in, um, our uh, aim here is to create a framework uh, for Silk Road Regional Tourism Development Plans, that is to uh, define the Silk Road concept the targets, the market segments, identify the sites, the attractions, and the experience, uh, define the uh, interregional Silk Road cultural routes, uh, develop a Silk Road culture storytelling, uh, design a regional branding or reputation. Thank you. It was uh, quite an uh, impressive uh, proposal. Uh, create entrepreneurial labels, 
uh, create tourism intelligence and communication tools, and finally, support cooperation and uh, networking. Uh, our next activity concerns uh, a training summer school in 2019, uh, Sustainable Tourism Development and Silk Road Cultural Heritage. <coughs> this will be, sorry, this will be co-organized by the European Interdisciplinary Silk Road Tourism Center together with our master program, Tourism and Local Development, which has just been launched, where six schools of Aristotle University participate, economics, law, environment, forestry, theology, agriculture, spatial planning, uh, 60 uni university professors to teach and uh, three orientations that are offered, tourism and regional development, uh, environment and sustainable tourism, cultural and religious tourism. We invite you to join uh, our uh, summer school. Finally, our next goal is the uh, creation of the Euro Mediterranean Silk Road Tourism Intelligence, the so-called the MAS in Greek that means to us. Uh, this actually will be, we plan uh, that it will be a digital platform for the cooperation between academia, local authorities and the tourism industry on the Silk Road countries. Uh, we intend to submit uh, a project proposal in Erasmus Capacity Building with the deadline the 7th of uh, February. Uh, Aristotle University uh, will um, actually capitalize its experience uh, gained by the European PhD Hub, which is um, an Erasmus Knowledge Alliance project going on. And um, it is actually the creation of a European digital platform uh, to, um, for the cooperation between uh, the tourism industry and academia. And by academia, we mean PhD holders, and PhD candidates and MSc students. We will have a dissemination event on, uh, on uh, December 14. So um, the proposed project partnership, uh, apart from Greece, is Uzbekistan, China, Egypt, uh, the European University Foundation, that is a consortium of more than 100 European uh, universities, and hopefully uh, United Nations World Tourism Organization. Of course, we will have uh, a larger project networking to include also Kyrgyzstan, Mongolia, Spain, Italy, Morocco. And please join us. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Stella, for the presentation. And um, thank you also very much for your partnership, because um, it is true, when we started to develop the Western Silk Road, we actually very quickly realized how important research is, because of course the Silk Road, you know, important names in history, Marco Polo, Gengis Khan, you, everybody knows about them, but when we started to actually look what type of Silk Road heritage was available in Europe, we realized that there was very little research done on this aspect. So, I mean, the first step of any tourism, transnational tourism route, is to start mapping and linking heritage together. And um, one of the nicest um, kind of outputs was that was to actually see um, you know lesser developed um, tourism destinations for example um, northern Greece had very very important Silk Road heritage which could also then be used to diversify the tourism off of the countries and and move forward um, so we, we'll, we'll get back to the, all those questions later because um, we're very short in time I'll, I'll, I'll just welcome the next um, um, speaker on our panel which who basically works already on the second step of transnational route development, which is already capacity building and destination management. Um, our next um, speaker, Barnaby Davis, is no stranger to the Silk Road because he recently returned from Kyrgyzstan. He's a published travel writer and a Guinness World Record holder in travel. He's worked uh, for a number of years as a tour leader, dealing firsthand with uh, Western guest expectations, and then as a tour guide trainer and strategic advisor on the Silk Road. Three years ago, he co-founded East Guides West, a company specializing in training, consulting, and connecting in tourism. East Guides West has met with governments, DMCs, and local tour leaders in Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Iran, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Mongolia, China, basically the whole Silk Road. Um, and eager to share his trips on the Silk Road marketing and product development, um, I'm very pleased to welcome today Mr. Barnary Davis. Thank you.
Thank you, Patrick, and good morning, although it's good afternoon already. What a huge honor to be invited to Happy Bulgaria. I liked that when I flew in. Welcome to Happy Bulgaria. Yeah. I'm here to talk about an area of the world that I've fallen in love with. How do we market the Silk Road to the rest of the world? Let's start with a question Patrick asked, which was, does the Silk Road have potential from a product and development point of view? Oh yeah, absolutely. As we've already heard, everybody's heard of Silk Road countries, but many haven't heard of the individual countries. Give you an example, my local guide, or one of my local guides in London the other day, said Tajikistan, is that a country, why would you go there? Yet when I said Silk Road, she said, ah, now you have my attention. So the Silk Road is most definitely a brand. Good news, a lot of the marketing already been done for us through television documentaries. In the UK, hundreds of thousands, John probably millions yeah, of people have just watched Joanna Lumley's Silk Road Adventure. Now talk about promoting historic roots and world civilizations. Patrick, invite Joanna Lumley to the next Congress. She was fabulous. She compared Tashkent to Paris. She said it's as stylish as Paris. How about that for a marketing headline? Tashkent, the Paris of the East. Yeah? In your Silk Road marketing, we've already heard, tie your product to something or somebody that people already know. Genghis Khan, Marco Polo, we already know those people. Or you could go a step further. Joanna Lumley, she even mentioned Freddie Mercury. You know the lead singer of Queen? He was raised as a Zoroastrian which led so beautifully into Zoroastrianism originating in Iran three and a half thousand years ago. How many of you would think to use the place that inspired Freddie Mercury in your marketing? Yeah. So just throwing ideas around. Go wild, go crazy, maybe not quite as crazy as Kai Marcus, but, but people do base, they book trips based on emotions. So the Silk Road is a brand even more, it's a safe brand. So sell that, and then sell specific regions after that. And companies that really know how to do that, to use Silk Road in their marketing, are tour operators such as Travel the Unknown, Wild Frontiers, we saw from Stella, Secret Compass, there are lots, and I'm just using UK examples. They know what their customers want. What are these tour operators saying that they want from you to fill a transnational tourism route is worthwhile. Pretty simple, a reassurance that cooperation is long-term. Yeah, a tour operator in London puts together a brochure a year in advance. They've got to know that what's in the brochure is what's going to happen on the road. That's the product that the guest has bought. So long-term cooperation between countries. And nobody's looking for European style easy borders, by the way. Half of the adventure, isn't it, is getting a passport stamp somewhere exotic. But the borders do need to be predictable. Yeah, they need to be predictable. If it's supposed to take an hour to get through a border, what happens if that then takes four hours because of political instability? What what's the knock-on effect to the rest of that day's Tour program, yeah, if it's in the brochure, has to happen. Golden rule, can't stress that enough. So I suppose if I had to sum up in one word what tour operators in the West are looking for on the Silk Road, I would say guarantees. And from a client's perspective, you as Silk Road partners are an extension of the tour operator. Yeah, any failings are a collective responsibility. You're a team. Nothing worse than a tour operator finding out about a problem from a client and they weren't already aware. Yeah, that decreases chances of word of mouth referral 
and repeat business, which is what we all want, of course. So be upfront and be realistic about expectations. We've talked about honesty in other presentations. Be realistic. If your guest house or your accommodation is average, let the tour operator know. That's okay. They would much rather have 50 happy guests than 100 guests of which only 75 are happy. Yeah, that's the quickest way to make a long-term partnership flourish. Yeah. I, so many times I hear, just bring us guests. And it's not necessarily the way. You've got to have a plan behind that. Yeah, tourism is a big family, which leads us to... That's a lot of borders there, isn't it? Yeah, it leads us to transnational cooperation. A problem shared is a problem halved, isn't it? I've got three suggestions. There are many initiatives for strategic tourism development out there. USAID, EU aid, Global Nature Fund, UNDP. We've seen lots and lots, but they're very scattered. Could there be a, a centralized strategy? Could they all be centralized and agree on strategies? Is that possible, maybe? And the calls for projects are very, very difficult for many DMCs on the ground. So could there be a, a, a WTO initiative, perhaps, to fill in applications to teach how to do that and apply for funding? So that's number one. Could we put together a Silk Road job market? Make things real for people. Yeah, give, give tourism providers an incentive. A symposium in Almaty or, or Baku or Bishkek with transnational funding, I would love to invite tour operators to come and network directly with local guides and DMCs to increase local employment. Yeah. It's worth considering here, many North American operators or European operators would much rather send somebody like me to run a tour in Central Asia. And the reason for that is I would be a safe pair of hands. I understand the guests, I know how to look after the guests. They'll know I'll fix problems on the ground. But what I'd really, really like to see with a little bit of intercultural training is local tour directors taking that work. Local knowledge, they know how to do it. That increases local employment. And it's not to mention huge savings for European tour operators on positioning costs. It's a win-win both ways. So could we have a Silk Road job market. Number three, when leading tours across borders, it's, it's not a great guest experience to be handed over to another tour guide at a border. If a guide finishes at a border, that's the end of his or her service. Probably doesn't care what happens the other side, but the tour operator does, and the guest does, of course. You'll hear me say this quite a lot. Yeah, a guide makes or breaks a tour. That's so true. That tour guide is a reassuring constant for the guests. They learn to trust that guide. So could there be a governmental initiative to issue tour guide visas for cross-border tours? Yeah, one leader to accompany the guests for the whole tour without visa issues. Is that possible? Because that one idea would hugely improve the guest experience. So who are you selling your product to? Your safe, wonderful product. Who's buying it? Because that affects your marketing strategy. For example, I wouldn't use the Freddie Mercury connection to Iran to attract the Arabic market. That doesn't resonate, does it? it doesn't make any sense at all. But it would certainly work in Britain. So look at your most powerful customers, what resonates with them, do your research. I'm sure you're already doing business to business here, but if I said one thing about business to consumer, I would say, well, here's, here's one thing. I heard the other day a million websites are built every day. A million. Unbelievable. That's a lot of clutter, isn't it, to get your message heard through. So if I had one suggestion, I would say headlines. 
headlines, super important. And people underestimate that. They come up with great ideas. If that subject headline is no good, nobody reads what comes next. How many of you open every email? Probably not. You, you learn if it's from somebody you don't know, you make a very quick decision based on that subject line, don't you, before you delete it, unless there's something of benefit. Okay, well, that's enough marketing. You can, you know, you could Google that sort of thing. Did anybody go to the World Nomad Games this year in Kyrgyzstan? Oh, well, I'll tell you, you missed a treat. It was absolutely fabulous, and I have to say, pretty well organized. A couple of things, though. Here's an, well, here's an example of what is not strategic tourism. Tourist season in Kyrgyzstan ends at the end of August. So many guest houses and hotels closed two days before. Two days before, 1,000 foreign visitors came to the World Nomad Games. Does that make sense? No. And I asked them why that was, and the reason was, well, we always close at the end of August. Yeah. Ah, now we've, you know, we've got to start changing that kind of thinking. Are you in tourism or not? You know, we've got to think a little bit outside the box there. Do you recognize the game there on the horses? It's called Cock Baru. It's, it's like polo, but with a dead goat. It's a national sport down there. It's a, it's a great game. My business partner took that, and she just came back from a fam trip, cross-border fam trip, Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan. Beautiful scenery. Beautiful people, but the product, it just wasn't quite right. Yeah. Can I make a suggestion on product development? Guests do not want to drive solidly for hours and hours and hours. Yeah. Particularly when there's no program at the other end. Shani, my business partner, she drove eight hours to a lake. They looked at it, no picnic, no hiking, no food, nothing, and then they drove back eight hours. Yeah, that is, that's not experiential tourism. That could have been two days better spent. Maybe a closer lake. Oh yeah, look at this picture just down in the bottom left there. The guide here is burning plastic bottles next to the food. Burning plastic in 2018, you can't do that. Go to any tourism fair, world travel market, ITB, all you'll hear is responsible tourism and sustainable development goals. Yeah. Europeans do not want to see practices that damage the environment. So there's a lot of room for education, for sure, across the Silk Road. Now, education, of course, costs money, doesn't it? Yeah. But what a return on investment. Tourism gives people the economic incentive to look after what they've got. Yeah. That is sustainable tourism. And the tourism potential revenue on the Silk Road is enormous. We've seen the the growth figures from Patrick and Stella just then. You need, of course, a level of infrastructure. You know that. Is it also there in the rural areas? There's big concern for DMCs at the moment in Mongolia. They're losing tourism revenue, low quality services in rural areas, and they can see that they're losing it. Are there toilets? It's a little thing, I was in Kyrgyzstan recently and I asked about the bathroom and the guy just gesticulated towards the woods, the forest. There it is, the, there are the toilets, yeah. Is the waste management, hotel capacity, are the vehicles safe, well-maintained, insured, that sort of thing. And are the guides committed to the job? Many, or so many DMCs tell me that guides treat the job as a hobby. Yeah, easy money. And that reflects, of course, as poor service to the guests. So it kills me, you know, they're beautiful countries, but guests are sometimes still going home disappointed. And that, to me, is a, a, a terrible shame. It's so frustrating. So there's a big need for funding across the Silk Road for development and capacity building skills. You get out what you put in. 
Yeah, and in a, a recent study on mountain tourism and sustainability in Kyrgyzstan, they concluded that tourism will only be economically viable if service providers have technical skills. So there is a lot of work to do, we know that, but with effective transnational cooperation, I think we can harness the development potential. That's me, by the way, as a tourist in, at the Nomad Games, underdressed and totally underprepared to meet the Deputy Minister of Tourism, and that's Stephen Leoy as well from USAID, he's a representative there. But we all stood together as the sun was setting over the Tien Shan Mountains. Mountains, it's beautiful there. And we all decided as we drank in that mountain air that Silk Road tourism has limitless horizons. Thanks for inviting me to happy Bulgaria. Um, thank you very much, Barnaby. That was very interesting because um, you know, you hear authenticity, uniqueness, this is new, this is novel, this is a must-see kind of place. You hear that you have to promote yourself like that nowadays. But what we actually learned from this presentation is once you're on the ground, you depend on vital services and infrastructure, on proper training. Because if that, doesn't, if that isn't in place, then um, your trip can pretty quickly turn into a nightmare or you'll at least come back with a very bad impression if certain services, certain trainings are not in place. So thank you. For, for bringing up that point. Um, we're very short in time, that's why I'm gonna just invite our third speaker of the day onto the panel. His name is Mr. Peter, Dr. Peter Beron. He's a Bulgarian zoologist and biospecialist, researcher of over 700 caves, and quite impressive, a discoverer of new animal species. He is the director of the National Museum of National History at the, Bul at the Bulgarian Academ Academy of Science who he's been a member of um, for over 12 years now. So Dr. Beron, if I can please ask you to the stage. Thank you. <clears throat> Excellencies, <clears throat> if any, ladies and gentlemen, very few minutes left. You are hungry and tired. You may find my presentation here a little dull because I have no pictures. I am not a distinguished speaker as the, the, the speakers we, we heard this morning. And I'm not a tourist. Neither tour operator, neither organizer of tourism. Actually, I'm a traveler, mountaineer, Caver. I was director for many years of the National Museum of Natural History in Sofia, the oldest Bulgarian museum, and I strongly advise you to find some time to visit this museum on the Tsarosovodito Avenue, <clears throat> number one. Very interesting museum. Uh, so, I have traveled all around the world collecting different insects, spiders, things, exploring caves, exploring the high mountain fauna of almost all high, high mountains in the world. And most of these things, I, uh, <coughs> I did under not very glossy and uh, comfortable uh, circumstances because I was 50 when the communist, co communism here officially ended in 1990. 90. I am now almost 80. So I still go. I'm just back from Vietnam. Last year I was on, on Kenya mountain, traveling over the mountain. Uh, the year before I was in caving expedition in Laos. So. <clears throat> I will speak on behalf of uh, people who are budget travelers, not uh, interested in the gains, in the revenue, in the tourist products, in the tourist uh, development, and so on and so on. I actually am not a tourist. 
because I was going to different places first for seeing them because in each country there is a list of things which are the must, the things you have to, to visit, you have to see. When you go to Toronto, you must see Niagara. When you come to Sofia, you must see the, the big cathedral, and etc., and our museum, indeed. Uh, the musts, and when I go somewhere, finding some small money from somewhere, I follow this list of the musts. This is for my own satisfaction. But uh, actually, uh, the purpose I go around is to collect animals for our museum, for our collections, with many, many new species for the science. This is important because in many countries, the devastation of the nature goes so fast that very soon these species will be gone forever. For example, all, all, all this deforestation in, uh, in tropical countries, etc. Uh, so, <coughs> this silk road, this is, <laughs> I was told two days ago that I have to speak about the silk road. I, I, that's why I don't have anything to show. I tried to find on the internet what is the, the map of this Silk Road? I found about 50, 60 maps of different Silk Roads. Now Silk Road is a very broad uh, notion, going from Indonesia to Britain and, uh, and Holland. Actually, I have visited all these countries, living in many of them months and months, uh, in the nature, in the mountains, and uh, I know many globe trotters which will follow this road, but not running. Uh, I haven't run even one kilometer <laughs> from this road. I have been to all these countries, but I, I was going very slowly, uh, just uh, uh, trying to get as much as possible from the country. No, 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 just uh, uh, also uh, uh, when I was playing tourist, going around the, the towns and villages and so on, I also was going slowly just to see and to remember better the things. Uh, going like this and especially bringing with you collections, there are additional difficulties. You have to have permits collecting permits, export permits, etc., 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 in many places. If you collect in the night with the light, you get arrested usually. You may spend some time in some jail because people don't know what are you doing. Uh, because the authorities and the police and so on, they know what a normal tourist do goes here, goes there, makes photos, uh, looks at the pigeons uh, on the San Marco place or so something. Uh, they don't, don't understand what are you doing in, in the wilderness, in the caves, etc. I was listening to our Greek <laughs> colleague, I remember in communist time, the northern border, Greece, was very well protected against the bad Bulgarians uh, coming from the, from the north. And as there are many interesting caves there, I was going in these caves and coming in the night, coming out in the night, I, I got arrested several times in Alistrati, in other places. So <coughs> this happens. So one has to be prepared very well. Uh, up to 1990, we, we uh, had no foreign currency, for foreign dollars, etc. So <clears throat> it was very difficult to, to get this foreign currency. M many of you even cannot imagine this. And the new, new generation in Bulgaria also 
I don't tell them because, because they wouldn't understand. And we are trying to make different sort of combinations. For example, uh, the communist government was sending sporting expeditions. For example, sporting uh, groups to, to climb Himalayan summits and so on and so on. And once I told them, get some zoologists or botanists in the expedition, the climbers may not be successful with the summit, but staying in the base camps, the, these uh, <coughs> scientists will collect new species, new things, and the expedition will have results anytime. Uh, and I, like this, I went to three expeditions to the Himalaya, altogether six months in the high Himalaya. Also, I have been twice in Indonesia and five months with British expedition to Papua New Guinea in the middle of the big forest. So, um, it is not impossible, but you have to be prepared, physically to be prepared, to read all uh, published in Lonely Planet or some other sources where it is written what to do and what and don't don't do this and this. For example, you 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 must learn that in in Thailand there are here people who will tell you that you, you shouldn't touch the head of anybody. You shouldn't be photographed uh, together with the Buddha statue, etc. etc. So there are prohibition there things which uh, you should not do. In Nepal, you, you should never give somebody your left hand. This is the dirty hand. This is a clean hand. This is a dirty hand. You have to know all these limitations. Traveling. Actually, this silk road is very long. It should be made by parts. Each part, it's enough to spend one or two months somewhere to get tired and to have enough of impressions. So you make one, one portion, go back, and after some time, you go again for one or two months. But to spend one year running or something, this is really too much. So, uh, <laughs> Uh, one of the most interesting parts, parts of the, this new Silk Road is the Balkan Peninsula. Balkan Peninsula is something fantastic. Uh, many antiquities, many islands, uh, churches, the natural phenomena, things like Meteora, to make some uh, publicity of Greece, Meteora or... or uh, Santorini or other places like this. Fantastic area. In uh, Middle Asia, you may find uh, long distances with very few points of interest. You just see the landscape and you have to cross them. But, but the Balkans, Balkans is full with uh, interesting places and things. And uh, to not keep your attention too long, I'll tell you only one story, for, because I have been to all these countries, as I told you, but how I saw Afghanistan. Yesterday, unfortunately, I, I didn't listen to the lecture about Afghanistan. But in 1986, during the war between the Russians and the Mujahideen people, they, the Russians organized something like People's Republic of Afghanistan occupied by them. And uh, as I'm working in the National Acad <coughs> in, the, in the Academy of Sciences of Bulgaria, this, the two academies of Afghanistan, the non-existing Academy of Afghanistan and our academy, had an agreement for exchange of weeks of visit. And uh, we received in the academy an uh, invitation for 20 days in Kabul for exchange of experience. 
I was the only person of the academy who agreed to go there in the middle of the war. Kabul was sieged, practically. <laughs> I found a very big knife like this from one collection, put it in my backpack. Actually, in, by this time, it was not prohibited to carry these things on the planes. <laughs> and I flew to Moscow, and from Moscow, I had to go to Kabul. In Moscow, the man who was checking my, my luggage said, ah, у вас багаже нож. You have a knife in your luggage. I said, yes, нож. Для Кабула этого не хватит. For Kabul, it is not enough, he said. But, but, but he, left me, he left the knife in my luggage. It was a knife this long. And uh, when I arrived in Kabul, I was met by a gentleman who was representing the Foreign Relations Department of the Academy of Science of People's Republic of Afghanistan, who was the, the, the head and the only member of this department. And uh, when we <laughs> were already on land, I, I saw that each machine, uh, each, uh, uh, for example, uh, plane or uh, helicopter uh, taking off or landing gives four big splashes of, uh, of magnesium. And I, I asked, uh, why is, is this done? Because of the rockets, the, the missiles from Pagman, very near to, to Kabul. They, they are shooting on the, on the airport very often. And this magnesium is detracting these missiles from, from the plane because they are hotter. Because this, these missiles by this time were English and Chinese, were not, a, a per, were not a, uh, this American, but th this was silkworm, silkworm and, uh, and uh, blowpipe. And <coughs> they, they were sensible to, to the temperature. And uh, when we started going to Kabul, and uh, this gentleman gave me the list of my stay, the program for my stay, 20 days. Meetings with ministers, visits to the Academy of Sciences, science account, attack the, <coughs> and so on. And I said, my friend, you, uh, you have mistaken the person because I'm not here to meet anybody. I have to go to the mountains, to the caves, to the desert, to collect things, he said, to glaciers and so on. He was looking at me like this, said, no, we didn't uh, uh, mistake the person, but you are in a wrong country. <laughs> he, said, he said, what mountains are we going to visit? I said, uh, uh, this and this, which is about 4,000 meters. He said, but even we cannot there because the Mujahideens are, are there. Pagman, Pagman is uh, very near to the Kabul, but they are shooting to the airport from Pagman. Host, it goes from one, one hand to another every day. Kandahar, where now are Bulgarian, by, by the way. Kandahar has police curfew of some 18 hours every day. You cannot go on the street, etc., uh, etc. Et I listed several other uh, cities. He said, no, you stay in the hotel and you, you will not go anywhere. I said, okay. And when he left me in the hotel, of course, I must tell you that dangers are not so big as described during the travel. Because when he left me, because, and he told me, you will stay here and not go to the fence because they will shoot you from the market. I took my camera, I took my tubes with alcohol, and, not for drinking, this for insects. And, uh, and uh, uh, I went immediately in the market, make, made photo to everybody there. 
Then I went in the old, old, old town where nobody of these Europeans uh, uh, dared to enter. Nobody attacked me. And there is a hill because Kabul is seven, 1,700 meters altitude. And there is a hill in the middle, Shardarwaza, which is another 600 meters. So 2,300 meters at the top. And this hill, nobody goes there because the Russian choppers were flying over every day and shooting to everything which moves. But I, I was collecting different things. And, and to, when, when uh, the chopper passed, I was saying uh, like this, and uh, nothing happened to me. And, <laughs> uh, and like this, I spent 20 days in Kabul. <laughs> no problem. So, so uh, uh, dangers are not so, no, not so big. Uh, many people will tell you different things. Don't believe them. Don't believe them. Uh, I'm, I, I may tell you many other things, but time is running short. So by the end, I was, because I saw uh, the inscriptions here that East meets West, was it? East meets, meets, meets West. Uh, well, uh, you know, everybody are Kipling. East is East, and West is West, and we'll never meet. <laughs> well, don't believe this, <laughs> because uh, uh, there is also from Rudyard Kipling the white man's burden. I was carrying my burden on <sighs> more than 90 countries here and there. Now the burden is shared between the white men and the yellow men from China, because the, the whole concept of the silk worm, <coughs> silk worm, <laughs> silk road, is coming from China, actually, with this 900 billion uh, dollars project. So all these people, East Asia, Central Asia, and Europe, may work together. And this is the point of our meeting here. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. That was very, very interesting. It's, um, you talked about in the 1980s, you got arrested for crossing the border between Bulgaria and Greece for visiting a cave. And nowadays, you can visit it um, without any problem. So who knows what the Silk Road will look like in 50 years. I'm not sure if you'll be able to take huge um, swords on, the, on, your, on your flights and stuff. But um, the progress we have done in just three... Well, I'm, I'm, well, we'll see, we'll see. But it's, incre it's incredible how quickly everything um, um, changes and how quickly everything advances, sometimes for the good, sometimes for the bad. But thank you very much for being here today. Um, we're very, very, very limited in time. We're over time already. Um, is there, are there anybody from the public? We can allow, I think, one or two quick questions. So if everybody, anybody has a question to one of our panelists, please raise your hand. Don't be shy. Now is the moment if you want to ask anybody any questions. Are you sure? Nobody there? Great. Um, well, thank you very much, everybody, for being here today. Thank you, Stella. Thank you, Barnaby. Thank you, Dr. Verdon. Um, I'm sure if you want to catch up with them on individual issues, um, just feel free to approach them. I would like to say thank you also to the interpreters for their good job today, to the technicians, and of course for the, to the Ministry of Tourism of Bulgaria for hosting such a, very nice, such a great event. I think the closing ceremony is on next, so thank you very much for being here, for listening to all our interventions, and um, well, we still have a day and a half together, so look forward to seeing you all soon, and after lunch, and during the technical tours. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, please give your final applause for Patrick Fritz and the rest of the panelists.
We've heard fascinating and interesting and very entertaining stories. It's always been a pleasure. Now I would like to invite Mr. Christopher Impson, UN WTO Deputy Director for Europe, for some final comments. Christopher, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, I know you're all very tired, so I'm going to make this very, very short. So we've come to the end of a wonderful event, and it's been such an honor to have you with us for the last two days. So, of course, I have to start by thanking the government of Bulgaria, and in particular the Ministry of Tourism, for the outstanding organization of this event, uh, and for hosting us so graciously here in Sofia. And I think that we'll have a technical tour after this. Please make sure to be good tourists as well. I want to thank the speakers, who are just excellent. I think we can all safely say that we leave here much more knowledgeable than when we came, inspired by what you've shared with us. We've learned how to well, explore caves illegally. We have also been encouraged to blackmail, so please take these lessons home with you. Uh, I want to thank the moderators, who've done a splendid job in keeping the discussions lively and interesting. John actually managed to make the speakers sing. This is something I've never seen before. I hope you all appreciated this. I want to thank our wonderful Master of Ceremonies, Nikki, who managed proceedings impeccably and kept us all under control with such grace. I know that you're not from tourism, but I hope that you've been inspired by this gathering of tourism professionals and the stories. Very good. We should not forget the hostesses, the technicians, the interpreters. Without you, we'd still be queuing outside or sitting here in the dark and not understanding a thing. So thank you very much for that. And <laughs> finally, it, it's so often the bosses who receive the credit for events like these, but much of the blood, sweat, and tears is put in by people like Eli Misheva from the Ministry of Tourism in Bulgaria, and by my own colleague Beatriz Cano. I'm not sure where she is, but please stand up if you're here. So thank you both for such a tremendous effort. This really is thanks to the efforts of you two. Ladies and gentlemen, I promised you I would keep this short. I think I kept that promise, and uh, thank you, and enjoy the rest of your time here. Thank you so much, Christopher. Thank you for inviting me. I'm usually not a host. I make movies, so it's a real pleasure that I'm here and uh, to have your trust. So now for final comments, I would like to invite here on stage Ms. Irena Georgieva, Deputy Minister of Tourism of Republic of Bulgaria. My speech won't be so long too, but distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I have the pleasure to close the second International Congress on World Civilizations and Historic Roads. This is the second time Sofia is hosting the International Congress on World Civilizations, and I do hope it will become, become a tradition. This Congress highlighted once again the importance of the historic roads for cultural and tourism development. We had the opportunity to dive into concrete examples of how historic roads were connecting people, shaping their lives and places they lived, bringing our world closer together, long before any other means of transportation and communication. From our side, from our, the side of Ministry of Tourism, I would like to thank to all of the speakers who told us about their different tourism strategies, approaches and initiatives for cultural and tourism development, and to our keynote speakers who inspired us to think differently about the way we reach out our tourists and the way we are promoting our destinations. In my role as a host, I would like also to encourage you to explore and discover our beautiful Bulgaria, a country with thousands of years of history and a cultural heritage 
that embraces ancient civilizations. A country where historic, archaeological and architectural monuments have been preserved and mixed with the modern cultural life. There are traces of the life of Thracians and Romans, proto-Bulgarians and Slavs, are woven into the city's busy life today. You could start with exploring our capital, Sofia, right after the end of our Congress on a special half-day technical tour on the city center of Sofia, organized for all the participants. Be welcome. I would like to use the opportunity to thank to UNWTO for the support in organizing this Congress and especially to Christopher. Christopher? Applause for him. Beatrice. Beatrice. Thank you, Beatrice. And Patrick. Patrick who are here with us, maybe, except pa Patrick, but... Uh, okay, Patrick, thank you. I would like to thank to our wonderful moderator, once again, Mr. Niki Iliev. I would like to thank to the team at Ministry of Tourism, you know all of them, Ivan Lupetkov, maybe he is not here, he's busy, Elvira Misheva, Zlatina Ljutova, Silvia Doncheva, and many other colleagues of mine. And, of course, thank you to all of you for your presence and attention. Thank you once again. Thank you so much, Mrs. Gurgieva. I, I appreciate your kind words. Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of the Second International Congress of World Civilizations and Historic Roots. Please join me to thank, to give a big round of applause to all the participants, all the translators, all the organizers, all the panelists, all the moderators who has joined us yesterday and, and today at this wonderful Congress. Thank you. And don't forget the, to take the city tour from 3 p.m. I think it starts downstairs from the lobby until 6. You'll get to enjoy the beautiful city center of our capital, Sofia. Have a good day.